Okay. I thought the presentations uh, were, were great. We, of course, uh, we, we stacked the deck. You know, Paul and I are on one side, you know, and, uh, allegedly. Uh, but we didn't know we were both going to talk about Zechariah 12. Uh, but what my, my question really uh, is to anybody who would like to answer it among our group, but particularly uh, Dr. Moon, Dr. Van Gameren, uh, how do you understand Romans 11 verses 12 and uh, 15? If you see uh, the end time salvation of ethnic Israel and then so in, an incorporation into the church and then sort of no kingdom attachment as somebody like, like I would, would believe because of the uh, phrases at the end how much more will the fulfillment be, of course, and if the reconciliation, rejection be the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? There just uh, seems to be uh, something more. It sort of begs the issue that uh, something dramatic happens on planet Earth after the salvation of Israel. Yes, I think something extremely dramatic happens. It's called the resurrection and the uh, coming of Christ. Yeah, uh, I think life from the dead I take to be a reference to the end time resurrection. Um, so Paul is in effect saying, you know, uh, if this has happened now in our current stage of salvation history, uh, what will the uh, ultimate ingrafting of the Jews again mean? It will mean the end is upon us, the climax and culmination of all God's plan marked by the resurrection. I would add to that, namely that uh, Paul sees himself as the servant of the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, that uh, the task of being the servant of Christ is still a part of Israel's mission as well. Uh, Israel received that responsibility, they have reneged on it and I would say that there has to be a time where Israel will then be witnessing to Israel, where it will be a light to the Gentiles and that need not be in terms of that evangelization en masse, namely that there's already the fullness of uh, the Gentiles. But it's going to be a tremendous, uh, it will have a tremendous effect upon the church, namely when Israel comes to salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, that will be uh, like life from the dead. So yes, the spiritual sense is a possibility, but I also would say my hope is to witness that tr tremendous transformation. The salvation of Israel and the consummation of the ages. Yeah, right. Sounds good. <laughs> uh, let me raise an issue of Dr. Mu. Uh, his position and mine are very close, but there's probably a little bit of a difference in that he sees that the Old Testament prophecies are directly fulfilled in the church. And I would still hold out, as I just argued, that there is still the responsibility that God has for Israel to be the servants of God. So I don't want to set that aspect aside and want to see that uh, Israel will fulfill its mission in the end. If I could uh, uh, chime in on this, I think a difference between what Dr. Mu has uh, presented and myself would be that he didn't put it this way, but the way I might put it would be that either the Old Testament prophecies and promises to Israel are going to be fulfilled in the church or they will be fulfilled to national Israel. My position would be, why not both? I think the New Testament warrants that they are fulfilled in some sense in the church, so we can't deny that. But in the Old Testament, I think uh, not only the prophecies and their nature, but the nature of the covenants having an unconditional element to them, it has to be fulfilled to Israel. Now, when you look at these Old Testament covenants like the Abrahamic, Davidic, the New Covenant, uh, I don't want to be misunderstood. I think that blessing under any covenant is always conditioned on obedience. But the unconditional element means that God is going to do this with some generation of Jews. And as I shared, I think that that's going to happen in a future day. So I don't see that Romans 11, 25 through 27 is either incorporating Israel into the church or something distinctive of, about Israel. I think it can be both and, although I do think that Romans 11, 25 through 27 is about Israel's salvation per se.
You look, you're, you're looking at me. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad to engage with that. Well, yeah, I, again, I want to be very brief yeah. so that we allow time right. for, for, for questions here. Um, uh, I, I do see this pattern of fulfillment in the New Testament that, that in a sense, leads me to take the position that uh, Old Testament prophecies in general find their fulfillment in the current stage of salvation history in and through the people of God of this era, uh, unless there's something in the New Testament text that, that requires a different kind of a referent, as I see in Romans 11. I'm not so sure about the continuation of the servant mission for the people of Israel. I, I see kind of a funneling here in which the nation of Israel is given the role of servant, then it funnels down to the remnant, then to the servant, Jesus Christ, who now fulfills those prophecies, and those are now extended not to, to Israel as a nation, but to the church, who are now those who are charged with the task of, uh, of bringing the good news, as it were, to the world. Now, it's my turn to just make a point of contrast because our concern is with Jewish evangelism. And so here's a, a point where I think there's a difference between Dr. Glazer and myself that is worth mentioning. We might want to probe that further. Um, Dr. Glazer thinks Romans 1.16, with the priority there, might suggest that it is a sort of appropriate or even a mandate for Christians and churches to make Jewish evangelism a priority. Uh, I, I'm not sure myself that's what that text means. I would point out that in chapter 2, verse 9, Paul reverses that and talks about trouble and distress, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile, which, which leads me to think that the pattern is not there, one so much of evangelized Jews first or as a priority and then the Gentiles, rather that the message of the gospel uh, is addressed, first of all, to the Jew uh, and then to the uh, Greek, uh, and that involves both the promises as well as the penalties, in a sense, of that address of the gospel. So that's you know, something we might want to probe further because it's a more bottom line question in terms of what these texts are, are saying specifically about the uh, priority of Jewish evangelism. One question that uh, stood out to me was, uh, uh, Dr. Mu, you raised the issue of the whole issue of the land issue and where this might go in that regard. And that relates also to Dr. Van German in terms of how this witness would be uh, carried forth, you know what I mean, uh, of, of the Jewish people. What are we going to do with this whole issue of the land? Who wants to interact with that question? I think that uh, uh, in all of this discussion, uh, if we see Old Testament prophecy uh, fulfilled in, in the church, uh, or if we, we see Old Testament prophecy uh, fulfilled in part in the church, in some way spiritually kind of Ladian, and then uh, also in, in Israel, I think uh, there's another issue that we need to address, and that is what about all the prophecies that speak about the land, the kingdom, that are not quoted in the New Testament? Do we have the right hermeneutically to say because these prophecies are fulfilled and or applied to the church, therefore, logically, all prophecies, because there are dozens and hundreds of them, all prophecies about Israel inheriting the land and uh, the kingdom being established uh, in, in Israel and Jerusalem as the capital and uh, Zechariah 14 celebrating tabernacles. I mean, all of these expansive passages, do we have the hermeneutical justification to say that because some are fulfilled in the church, all are fulfilled in the church? I suggest that that is not the case. Therefore, the land will come to the Jewish people when the Jewish people accept the king. I would have a different response, namely that it's not an issue of fulfillment, but rather that we look at the fulfiller. The essence of the gospel is the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, we receive then an insight in terms of the importance of the resurrection, the new community, and the new creation. Uh, all too often, we, I feel, are getting hung up in terms of exactly the manner and the timing of fulfillment. I would say that God is the one who's free in that regard. And we have seen throughout the history of redemption, God's commitment on the one hand, so that God is faithful, but at the same time, he is sovereign, he is free. And all too often we bind him by our interpretations. I would rather like the phrase that the New Testament accords with Moses and the prophets, so that we can see the relationship is a little bit more tenuous rather than that we have a one-to-one -one equation. 
Okay, I think what we'll do is we'll turn it over to the audience in terms of these mics over here, these sides, and if you'd like to raise a question, maybe something's been prompted, feel free to do so. I'll put this down so it's out of the way here. <laughs> please. I'll, uh, I'll address the question of the panel and you can choose who would Would you like. please introduce who you are? I'm, my name is Grady Hauser. Okay. I'm a graduate of Trinity, but not the seminary. <laughs> Uh, so my, my question is a, a, a bit more from a layman's perspective tonight, but I'll leave it to the panel to decide who would like to answer. I wonder, a two-part question, please. What is your own eschatology relative to the rapture of the church? When does that occur to, relative to the events that you've discussed tonight? But secondly, is it just intuitive or is there any biblical basis to think that that, that, that cataclysmic event that we would call the rapture of the church would be an influence to the salvation of the Jews who could hardly not notice it. Well, I will address that. My, my own personal understanding of end time prophecies is that the rapture happens before the tribulation and that means it's not at the same time that the second advent is. Uh, as I understand Zechariah 12, the Holy Spirit is going to be poured out on Israel at the second advent, not necessarily at the rapture. So uh, I think there will be a lot of people who wonder what's going on, but um, that doesn't mean they're going to say, oh, well, uh, maybe the Bible was right about this and we better get right with Christ. Even if people come to that conclusion, unless the Holy Spirit works in their heart to drive them to Christ, uh, they're thoroughly capable of rejecting the truth. I mean, when Christ was here at the first advent, uh, a lot of evidence was there as to who he was and people were able to reject that. It's going to be possible later on in history too. Kevin Moon, um, thank you so much uh, for sharing tonight. My question is related to the discussion on Zechariah 12.10. Um, I'm coming to it with fresh eyes in this context, and so uh, my initial glance at it is that I see a potential for um, the, the physical, visible appearance of Christ or um, more the, the spiritual component of, of finally seeing what the Messiah has done uh, on the cross. Um, so I, I heard predominantly the, the physical element from, um, from what I perceived, and so um, one, um, does anyone here have the kind of spiritual approach to that uh, passage? And two, what are the implications of either approach? By spiritual, do you mean that there won't actually be a literal return of Christ at that time? Or, or just what do you mean by spiritual approach? No, um, so I guess... In, in seeing that passage, I don't see it necessarily having to refer to what will be literal second coming of Christ. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering what in that passage would, would point me in that direction to say, no, that is, that is specifically talking about the second coming, being a physical appearance of Christ, um, or is there, is there possibility that it's going to be, or that that specific passage may be talking about their, their spiritual coming to an understanding. So it doesn't have to be referring to the second coming. Shall I, Jack? If you like, sure. You can't limit uh, chapter, you can't just look at chapter 12. Um, first of all, we don't know whether or not Jesus comes and they see him or whether they see him and he comes. It's very difficult to pick out, pick out, you know, understand it. Uh, but what we do know is that the response to seeing Christ is massive repentance, family by family, tribe by tribe. And uh, that happens at the end of chapter 12. And then, if you look at the beginning of chapter 13, a fountain is opened. Uh, you know, that's where we get the, the hymn from, filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And so the, the, there is a, uh, a fountain that is uh, available now to the Jewish people who have repented for purity and for, uh, for forgiveness. And so you see a, a turning to Christ, a repentance, you see a, a cleansing from sin, 
And then if you take that one step further and look at chapter 14, verses 3 and following, you'll see that his feet stand on the Mount of Olives, and the Mount of Olives is split in half. And then he, this one who comes, destroys the enemies of Israel. And then if you continue through chapter 14, you see that he establishes uh, his throne. And the kingdom is established, and the Gentiles are supposed to celebrate Sukkot tabernacles, which is always in Judaism uh, the, the festival of universality, of inclusiveness of the nations. And so I believe that if you take Zechariah 12, 13, and 14 all the way through, that you see the sequence of events that help it all make sense. Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, this is, may not address your exact question, but I think it's a little complicated, isn't it? Because, uh, of course, as, as, as most of us know, Zechariah 12, 10 is, is picked up two different places in the New Testament. It's picked up in John 19, where you have the crucifixion with the emphasis on the pierce. It's picked up in Revelation 1 when it talks about the return of Christ. I think it's pretty clear reference to the return of Christ there, where they will look on me whom they have pierced, although there it's not clearly confined to Jews, although it might be. The other factor, of course, is that there are several key texts from Zechariah 9 to 14 that are taken up in the Passion Narratives of the Gospels and applied to Jesus' uh, death uh, and resurrection. Uh, and so there seems to be sort of this classic kind of inaugurated situation here in Zechariah 12 where, where unlike Dr. Glazer, I'm not sure I read this as a sort of linear description of, of events at the end of history, but rather uh, sort of a typical uh, not yet uh, already uh, combination of fulfillment that's a little bit harder to sort out in my view. I would add to that that uh, the prophets, especially the post-exilic prophets, uh, are speaking about an eschatological battle that is going to be experienced in every generation. So that every generation has to be able to face the opposition to the gospel. And that is also in view in Jesus' uh, Mount Oliver discourse where he speaks about an eschatological battle. And I, again, don't want to put any kind of sequencing there. It is a matter of how the present age and the millennial age and the new age are all kind of coming together. And it's very difficult for us to separate everything in terms of a sequencing of events. But in the end, the kingdom of God will be established. If I could address uh, that as well. I guess, Kevin, I would want to ask, what is it in Zechariah 12.10 that would make you think that the looking upon him is not a physical, uh, visual, with, with eyes, seeing? And whatever that is, you're going to have to be able to apply it, for example, in verses 2 and 3, where it says all the nations of the earth will be gathered against it. That also could possibly mean something spiritual. So, sure, is it possible this could be spiritual rather than physical? You bet. But one has to come up with the contextual evidence that that's the way the author wants us to understand it. Okay, yes, over here. My name is Jerry Kahn, and uh, first, first I have a comment uh, regarding the uh, uh, reference to Romans 1.16 and Romans 2.9, uh, the, bringing the gospel to the Jew first, and then also saying, well, tribulation will come to the Jew first. Well, it also seems this was Jesus' priority. He said that if, uh, if the world hates me, it will hate you also. So as the gospel is brought to the Jew first, tribulation will come to the Jew first as well. Uh, that, to me, makes a lot of sense. But specifically, uh, departing a little bit from uh, Zechariah 12 and looking at Ezekiel 36 to 40, uh, and specifically Ezekiel 3624, for I will take you, speaking of Israel clearly, from the nations, gather you from all the lands, and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. This is the, the priority seems to be Israel coming into the land, then being saved. And it's clearly speaking of the land which we see today inhabited by the Jewish people. Your comments? 
This comes in a passage, of course, that uh, I think does again find fulfillment uh, in the first uh, coming of Christ about putting my spirit in you, moving you to follow my decrees, parallel to the new covenant prophecy of Jeremiah, which uh, Hebrews 8 makes clear is fulfilled presently in the church. So I see this as a classic case in which our New Testament writers have taken this language uh, and not so much uh, spiritualized it, but Christified it and universalized it and find fulfillment uh, in particularly the first coming of Christ and the offer of the spirit and the new obedience that he has made possible for his people. I would completely agree with Dr. Mu on this. But. However. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that was coming. <laughs> It's, uh, and Dr. Moon understands this, and those of you who are New Testament scholars understand it. There was a, uh, uh, more of a first century rabbinic uh, hermeneutic, a way of applying uh, the uh, Tanakh, the Old Testament scriptures, to the common everyday experience of Jewish people. And so we, we understand that uh, some of these Old Testament prophecies and passages, uh, it's not that they have dual fulfillment, but they apply in some way, and the rabbis did this all the time, it's all throughout the Mishnah, if you read it, it's just there all the time. They apply um, uh, something from the prophets to their own experience, but that doesn't take away from the fact that there will be a literal fulfillment of what was expected. I would add to that the importance of the post-exilic era. Uh, when you take a look at the witness of Haggai and Zechariah particularly, uh, they are saying that new era is here. Um, the new exodus is here, Haggai. Uh, very similar in terms of that Zechariah speaks about the continuity of the temple, the priesthood with Joshua, the uh, uh, function of Zach uh, Zerubbabel. We find the cleansing of uh, Joshua or Joshua. So that uh, Zechariah is saying the cleansing is taking place. And he envisions then a whole community that's going to be cleansed. And to some extent, there was it cleansing. Listen to Ezra and Nehemiah. They were very much concerned with the new Israel. When you read then First and Second Chronicles again, he's concerned with the whole of Israel. So that in the post-exilic community, we have a representation of the 12 tribes of Israel. So I don't want to move too quickly to the New Testament, as some of you know, that have been uh, courses. We need to listen to the Old Testament witness and the Old Testament story of its own fulfillment. I think we too often go too quickly to the New Testament or too quickly to eschatology and don't see the work of God throughout history. If I could address the, the particular prophecy you mentioned, you mentioned coming back to the land and then the spiritual response to God. If we were living in Ezekiel's time or for many years after that, I think we would assume that all of those things would be uh, fulfilled at exactly the same time. Um, I, I think for people who think that we have seen the fulfillment of the return to the land in the last century, um, well, we surely haven't yet seen the salvation of Israel. Now, I'm not saying that I know that the return to the land prophecies were fulfilled in the last century. We have to wait and see whether God's going to do the rest of those things that he said he would do. But what has happened in the 20th century and into the 21st century should alert us to the fact that there are different elements to these promises and prophecies, and they may not all be fulfilled exactly historically at the exact same moment. There may be a little bit of time between various parts of it being uh, fulfilled and other parts being fulfilled. I'll just add one thing, and that is the combination of Jeremiah 31 and Ezekiel 36 and 2 Corinthians 3, as it relates to the ministry of the New Covenant by the Spirit, it mixes the two passages together. That's just in, in supporting what Dr. Mu was saying about how this is real now, uh, not saying anything about what that might mean in terms of what's coming. Could, could I respond to this just uh, as well? I think sort of a classic passage is what Peter says on the day of Pentecost. This is that which was spoken of by Joel the prophet. That is a reason that I have to see a fulfillment on the day of Pentecost of the Joel passage. But what Peter does not say, this and this alone is that which was spoken of by Joel the prophet. If he had, then that would be the only possible fulfillment one could see. 
He does not say that, le that leaves open the possibility that there could be a further fulfillment of Joel's prophecy uh, in Israel as, as a nation. And once again, just uh, to jump in as well, we must consider all of those Old Testament prophecies that are Israel-centered, land-centered, uh, redemption-centered, that, uh, that are going to take place some, sometime future. There was no record of their being fulfilled uh, in the post-exilic period, no record of their being fulfilled in the New Testament period. Certainly this is a hermeneutical discussion. Uh, there is basically uh, a, a, a sort of two schools of thought, and one school says that because the New Testament writers apply certain Old Testament passages about the future kingdom and the land and the restoration of Israel to the church, it gives us justification to apply all the passages in the Old Testament, even those that were not mentioned as being fulfilled in the church and not having a future fulfillment. As believers, we need to make a decision as to whether or not we believe that hermeneutic is adequate or justified. Hi, uh, my name is Michael McKittrick, and uh, I just have a question about uh, Messianic Judaism, um, actually for Dr. Moon and for Dr. Glazer. Um, I've run into it recently, actually went to a service, and just found it very interesting to kind of hear their thoughts. And as I've, I've been trying to work through, um, is Messianic Judaism almost kind of a schism of the church? Like, is the eventual church need to be more rooted in Old Testament, like, say, celebrating the Passover? Or if you do take the hermeneutic of the prophecies being fulfilled in the church, um, is there something maybe going on in the Messianic Judaism that almost takes away from the fact that we have, we have a new identity in Christ, all of us, whether Gentiles or Jews or Scythian or Barbarian, like some like Galatians would say, that how we're all the same in Christ now. Maybe just some responses from Mu and Glazer, just from the two different perspectives on that. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's a really big question, but well, yeah. yeah. I always defer to the Gentiles. <laughs> <laughs> That leaves me out. <laughs> Who wants to answer this? Well, I'm, 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 I'm hesitant because I, I don't know enough about all the different branches of Messianic Judaism. I understand there's a lot of diversity in the movement, and so it's, it would be terribly easy to generalize and make comments so that aren't accurate to the movement as a whole. Uh, just, you know, from my reading of the New Testament, um, uh, I, I think that God is very interested in the unity of his people, of Jew and Gentile believer together praising God. That's one of the climaxes of Romans. You could argue that Romans 15, 7 and 5, uh, Romans 15, 1 to, to, to 7, and then with Scripture backing it up in 8 to, to 12, is a climax of the letter. It's what Paul, in one sense, wants to do. He wants to bring Jew and Gentile believers together, praising God with one voice. And um, I, I, I worry, I'm not saying it's wrong necessarily, uh, I realize there are, are certainly reasons for it, but I do worry that uh, a Messianic Judaism that insists on following uh, a Jewish calendar and observing Jewish festivals uh, makes it difficult for Gentiles to be part of that and can uh, foster uh, the kind of separation that it seems to me the New Testament is urging us to overcome uh, as a, a single community of believers drawn from all kinds of races and nations and languages celebrating the grace of God together in unity. It's a complex issue. I, do, I also believe that the, the unity of the body is, must be preserved at all costs, and I think Paul is very clear on that. And, uh, but I, I think if you view Messianic congregations as simply another type of homogeneous church, uh, Korean, Chinese, Russian, whatever it might be, and uh, all the elements of Jewish society, which would include the calendar, would include worshiping on a Friday or a Saturday, um, all those types of things are, are natural to us. Music in a minor key, a different kind of liturgy, rather than, you know, rather than a traditional Episcopal, Baptist, or, or charismatic, or whatever, whatever form of service you, you follow. And so I think the elements of Jewish worship you know, are, are easier for Jewish believers to, uh, to enjoy. 
I believe that if Messianic Jews in any way keep <coughs> Gentiles out of their fellowship, then they've crossed a line that Paul has made very clear over and over again. And so I think we need to be inviting. And I think, you know, it's in, in a way for a Gentile believer, it's sort of a, an experience of being grafted into the rich root of the olive tree, in a sense. You know, to enjoy and, and, and rejoice with their Jewish brothers and sisters in some, some of these things but exclusion of uh, anybody from uh, worship uh, is just uh, non-Pauline, unscriptural. Uh, thanks very much. I know it was a tough question, but thank you. Thank you. On this side. Um, I'm, my name is Jacob Lloyd. I'm on the undergrad side. Um, I'm delving into Revelation, which is probably a bad sign to begin with, <laughs> but I'd like to ask um, for those of, you, of the panel who said that you know it's going to be a big end times thing, does, are you associating that also with the 12, um, 12, 12,000 12, 12, mentioned in Revelation 7? And for those of you in the panel who, dis, who were saying that it was more like a gradual thing or like right now in the church age, are you, how do you reconcile it with that passage? Is, I'm just wondering how that passage fits into this discussion. I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> You're brave. First of all, I take the 144,000 as representative of the church, not so much of Israel. And that there is a symbolism very clearly in terms of 12 times 12 and 10 times 10 times 10 uh, to express the fullness of the people of God. Uh, with regard to then to any kind of eschatological scheme, I don't really see that that's that relevant because it is then uh, also the description how the people of God are coming from all the nations, tribes, and languages. Uh, there's a celebration in terms of the fullness, the wholeness. And then when you think in terms of the New Jerusalem in chapter 21, uh, where again the number 12 is very significant as then embodying the uh, Jerusalem that has come from on high as being the presence of God with his people. For me, if I wanted to link a cataclysmic end time event with the book of Revelation, there are several places I would go. I don't think I would go to the passage you're mentioning. Uh, I probably would go first to Revelation 19, 11 and following, where Christ rides out of heaven with the armies of heaven to do battle. And I think that that is at the end of the tribulation. Okay. Hello, my name is Bill Schulze. I have a degree in science and biblical and theological studies. I've been a Bible teacher since 1969. I'd like to draw everyone's attention to page 797 in the Bibles underneath your seats, uh, beginning at uh, Ezekiel chapter 36, beginning at verse 16. First of all, I'd like to tell you that I've always had a place in my heart for the Jewish people, and I've witnessed the Jewish people uh, since 1959. I worked with uh, Jewish scientists at Argonne National Laboratory for 35 years. And uh, I had Bible verses all around the walls of my lab, and, and I had a lion and a lamb sitting on my desk. Um, I'd like to begin here at Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 16. Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, Son of man, when the people of Israel were living in their own land, they defiled it by their conduct and their actions. Their conduct was like a woman's monthly uncleanness in my sight. So I poured out my wrath on them because they had shed blood in the land and because they had defiled it with their idols. I dispersed them among the nations, and they were scattered throughout the countries. I judged them according to their conduct and their actions. And wherever they went among the nations, they profaned my holy name, for it was said of them, these are the Lord's people, and yet they had to leave this land. I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel profaned among the nations where they had gone. Therefore say to the house of Israel, this is what the sovereign Lord says. It is not for your sake, house of Israel, that I am going to do these things, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you have gone. I will show the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, the name you have profaned among them. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the sovereign Lord. 
when I am proved holy through you before their eyes. For I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Then you will live in the land I gave your ancestors. You will be my people and I will be your God. God is going to do it. He's going to give Israel a new heart. And all Israel will be saved. All the remnant will be saved. Yeah, my name is Josh Cohen. Uh, I'm a Wheaton student and a Messianic Jew, which is a somewhat rare condition. Uh, Dr. Mu, I was just wondering if you could respond to Dr. Feinberg's earlier argument about um, God's promises, his reliability, his faithfulness to Israel sort of being a, uh, a linchpin or a guarantee of his faithfulness to the church, and how in your framework of uh, this universalizing hermeneutic, where exactly would the guarantee, uh, where would it be? You know, us being hoping for Christ's return and for eternal life and the resurrection of the body and all those things, if in some way salvation history suggests we can rely on those promises because of God's faithfulness to Israel, um, where do you locate that guarantee? I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I'm getting your question. Let me, let me respond and see if I'm, I'm getting to what you're asking. Uh, I agree entirely with what Dr. Feinberg is arguing about the function of Romans 9 through 11. Uh, that uh, if God cannot be relied upon to fulfill the promises made in the old uh, covenant, we can hardly rely upon him to fulfill other promises he has made to us. So Paul reaffirms and interprets in the light of Christ those promises. He does both in Romans 9 through 11. So it's not just a matter of saying uh, it's simply uh, word for word what was said in the Old Testament without any regard to the progress of salvation history or the shape of fulfillment in Christ. But it is the fact that all of the promises that God has made throughout the Old Covenant do find their fulfillment interpreted in light of Christ and uh, in light of the movement of redemptive history that, that Christ has brought about. So, in other words, in the original context, that kind of gets pushed aside. The, the hermeneutic is always to, to reinterpret, even though the original hearers often would have understood those things as being to Israel as a nation, um, and even going with the land promises, the things that aren't mentioned in the New Testament. I, I, mean, I mean, just to take one small example, if we look at Genesis 15 and this idea of Abraham being promised a land, where exactly does that fit um, and any of the other uh, promises along sure. similar lines? Sure. Again, in a general way, I think what happens is that there is an organic connection. I don't think it's a movement from God said this in the Old Testament, and oh, he's completely changing the terms in the New. But rather there's an organic growth of the promises, a movement of the promises uh, in the course of redemptive history. So when Matthew says, oh, oh uh, you know, when he, Jesus comes out of Egypt, that has to do with Hosea talking about out of Egypt I've called my son. If Hosea were around to read the Gospel of Matthew, I believe he would have reacted something like this. Oh, that's interesting. That's not exactly what I had in mind, but... I see what you're doing in light of the where things have gone s s since then. I think that's the general shape we find in the New Covenant. So if Abraham was around, uh, he would say in light of Romans 4.13, wow, this is great. God promised me this land of Palestine, and now that's universalized, that the people of God are going to inherit the entire universe. The whole world is ours. Uh, so, so there is, again, growth and movement in that way that I think is suggested by the uh, movement of redemptive history. So my, my hermeneutic arises out of reading the way the New Testament treats a lot of prophecies in response you know, to Dr. Glazer's point. I think there is enough of a consistent pattern established throughout the New Testament to justify our putting in place a general hermeneutic about the way we read the Old Testament in light of the New and may I just add to that, it's not just the New Testament. I think the witness really lies in the Old Testament, where the prophets are interpreting the promises, where the psalms or the psalmists are interpreting the promises, especially Isaiah. Uh, he remains such a pregnant prophet trying to uh, understand what God is doing in his own time, reflecting on the past, on the present, and at the same time looking for the future that all too often we miss so much 
in terms of the connection between old and new because we have a static view of the old and then we see new things happening in the new. But these things are already foreseen within the Old Testament itself. So there's a dynamic element within the Old Testament. If, if I could respond just briefly, the, I think we need to be careful we don't mix two separate issues that I think we're getting mixed in the question that you asked. One question is how does Romans 9 through 11 fit into the logic of the book of Romans? Dr. Mu and I are entirely in agreement on that. I would strongly encourage you to read his commentary on Romans 9 through 11 and you'll see that what I've said is not anything unique or new. There is, however, the separate issue of what is the hermeneutic that we should apply to Old Testament prophecies about the future of Israel. That's where he and I have a difference of opinion, but it's not on how Romans 9 through 11 fits into the overall structure of Romans. Okay, now we need to be quick here so that we can get a couple more questions in, so quickly. Okay. Oh, my name is David Lovey. Um, my, I have a two-part question, but it's very quick. One is, uh, what constitutes an ethnically Jewish person? I'm half Jewish. My dad's Jewish. My mom was not, so I'm more of a Samaritan, kind of. Uh, uh, <laughs> and, and so, for those who believe that the all Israel is ethnic Jewish people, would that also include people who are half Jewish or a quarter Jewish? That's the first thing. And then the second thing is, in Zechariah 13, it talks about, um, in 13 verse... 8 and 9, in the whole land, declares the Lord, two-thirds will be struck down and perish, one-third will be left in it. Uh, this third I will bring through the fire, I will refine them like silver and test them like gold. They will call on my name and I will answer them. They will say, or I will say, they are my people and they will say, the Lord is our God. Could that specifically be the all Israel, that third who the Lord brings through? Well, I guess I better take the first part of that one. And uh, I was just going to say, you don't look Samaritan to me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, According to, uh, according to scripture, uh, being Jewish is patrilineal for the most part because it, it goes through the father. In rabbinic Judaism, basically in the second temple period because there were so many, according to Jewish tradition, so many rapes and so many problems that uh, uh, things changed and uh, being Jewish was, the, was uh, viewed as coming through the mother. Um, you know, those of us who uh, uh, follow the Bible, I think, uh, probably have an option with either one, through the mother or through the father. At the end of Numbers, you have the situation with the daughters of Zelophedad, which give us a good basis for uh, uh, the uh, right of uh, the, the Bible actually saying it could go through the mother as well, through the daughters. And so uh, I think you're in basically. <laughs> you know, go either way. Um, and uh, I think that, I think, you know, listen, God said don't intermarry in the Old Testament, you know, so, you know, we made it complicated. <laughs> and so I think we're just going to have to let him sort that out in the end, and uh, John will answer the other one. <laughs> no, I will speak, speak to that one, too. Re remember the context during which Paul writes and during which the Old Testament is written. Much, much different than what's happened over the last 2,000 years with all kinds of intermarriage and, uh, you know, where it's, even with the DNA sample, you might not know uh, what the biological background is. As was said, God knows what that is, and he'll sort it out at the appropriate time. Does anybody want to try the other one? Let's I, I just, just comment on, on, the, on, on the kind of a complicated situation here. You, you quote verse 8, but the end of verse 7 is something that is quoted in the Gospels as fulfilled at the time of Jesus' arrest in the garden. So, again, you get this inaugurated kind of a situation which is not easy to sort out sometimes in these prophecies. Uh, hi, my name is Rob. I'm nobody of consequence. But uh, <laughs> how, this, could I start with a question started to Dr. Moon and Dr. Van Gemmeren? Uh, would you agree with Dr. Glazer's premise that there still exists a number of physical prophecies to Israel that have been unfulfilled? And if so, can you talk a little bit about the process hermeneutically of moving from a, like a specific land and a specific city to a global fulfillment?
The Old Testament is so complex so that, for example, Zion can refer to the physical city of Jerusalem. But there is also a theological layer. And we want to see things one way or the other. And I think we have to pay attention to the complexity uh, of the message. When it comes then to the promises to is Israel, I would say all of us are expressions of ethnicity. And we see that God takes care of our ethnicity. So in my case, I am then from Europe. I see myself as a European. Uh, and I'm very grateful for that ethnic background. And I would want to say the same thing in terms of my Jewish brothers and sisters. There's an ethnicity that is important. We celebrate that ethnicity within the context of the church. Now, how will that ethnicity come to expression? There is where we differ, in that there may very well be an ethnic expression in terms of the Jews living in the land, as some of my dispensational brothers are saying, where they will be living in the land forever and ever in the eternal state. Maybe, but I'm not sure. I don't know if that's that important. I leave it to the freedom of God, and I don't need to decide on that. But what I think is very important is to move everything through a grid found within the Old Testament itself. And here I come back again to the post-exilic era. Small as that may have been, it was important, so important that a number of books reflect uh, the redemptive historical significance of that event. We don't pay too much attention to it. I agree with my colleague Mu that we need to go to the New Testament ultimately. But I think all too often we move too quickly to the New Testament. And I want to see that God is at work over those 600 years, working out his purposes. Complex as it gets to be mired down in the story of human beings. Uh, but we have to pay attention to what God is doing. What God is doing likewise in the present time. And I'm reluctant to predict what he will be doing. I, uh do you have a burning question that you would be the last one? That I will be the last one? Okay. <laughs> Hello? Okay, my name, is, my name is Miguel Santiago, which means uh, who is like God, Saint Jacob. <laughs> but I don't, I'm not a, I'm, I don't know if I'm Jewish or not, but oh, God only knows. Um, but we wouldn't have Jesus without the Jews, so. Um, I have a question about atonement. Uh, it was the uh, Christ crucifixion necessary in relation to uh, evangelism to the Jews and a separate covenant that some Christians think that the Jews have so they don't need to be evangelized. And I'm, my question about that is, do you think it uh, poses a potential risk of anti-Semitism, i.e. what I heard before about Christ killers? So, you know, some people think that uh, Christ, it wasn't necessary for Jesus to be crucified for atonement. So how about that? You know, do, what do you think about that? Are you referring to the idea of a special covenant that is a salvation well, covenant it, for Jews only? Yeah, like, yeah. like they, uh, we don't need to evangelize them because they have their separate covenant. I, I, think, you know. I think one of the great responses to that comes from uh, Bishop Wright, who, uh, who says that that kind of view is the ultimate anti-Semitism because it excludes the Jewish people from the only place where they can find salvation, in Jesus Christ himself. So I, I think that's the ultimate anti-Semitism. So was that a burning question? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's, there's only ever been one method of salvation. Yeah. Uh, as time has progressed, we, uh, in, as you move through the Old Testament and the New Testament, we get clearer about the details about that, but we don't change the method. Yeah. And really, this whole discussion is all about that ultimate day when the Jewish people do come to salvation, and that salvation is, comes through accepting Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much for your participation this evening, and thank you very much to the panel. Let's, let's thank you. So let's, uh, let's uh, stand and pray here as we, as we close. Let's stand and pray. <sighs> Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to look into your word, to think about your program of salvation, to think about Jesus himself and the centrality of that work in all of history and in our lives. 
And Father, we commit ourselves to you and to your work. And we ask that your hand would be upon us in it. That your Holy Spirit would work through us to bring the truth of the gospel to the Jew and to the Gentile. And Father, we are looking forward to that last Gentile too. And we do ask that your hand would guide us to that. And we leave it in your hands in terms of what you're going to do and how you're going to do it. We commit it to you in Jesus' name. Amen.